This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 216 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Hands On Gloves, the all-in-one revolutionary bathing grooming gloves. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network. And today we have Dr. Madison Seedman's back. Some of you will remember him. Always a progressive veterinarian and makes you laugh too. I love him. He's going to talk about some stem cell therapy developments. That's fun. And then we also have Monty Roberts with Jane Holderness Rodham. And that's an equestrian group of great accomplishment right there. This is Debbie Lauks, and you're listening to The Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. The Horsemanship Radio airs on 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Jen, with me today. Hi, Jen. Greetings, Debbie. Has, has the world settled down a little bit over there in, in Sullivan, California? You mean since the passing of the Queen, I think, since right? Since the passing of the Queen. Yeah, yes. yeah, no. Um, we have, we have. let's see, uh, as we record this, last night the crew was here from Entertainment Tonight, and before that was uh, two or three interviews yesterday, and literally mom and dad got off the airplane and back at midnight on Tuesday night. The funeral was on Monday, and you can just backtrack from there. I, We're up to to at least a couple dozen interviews at this point, just in the last, what, 10 days or something. So wow, not complaining, first world problem, but, um, you know, the, the challenge is they have a 30 plus year relationship and somebody sort of put it in, in sync when, and when they said that's half, that's nearly half her reign. That's and a good you, point. Yeah, yeah. When you think about nearly half her reign, you think how, how many things she's done in all those those years. And and dad said, you know, I, I did a little approximate of how many times I call her per year with and he goes over there and trains the horses, blah, blah, blah. And and it's about two hundred phone calls that she never refused one from him when he called in to do his re- report and talk to her. And even one was when she was in Northern Ireland meeting with some pretty important people about their troubles. And that one blew him away more than anything because he really he, he didn't mean to pull her out of anything or say anything, but he um, you know, he was surprised when she came on the line. So because they kind of warned him, you know, she probably won't be able to take this call. So anyway, the, all of that, um, I, I don't think a lot of people knew really how how close or how long the relationship had gone on. But I think a lot of horse people will resonate with this one. There was a, a scene during the procession that a lot of people will remember when uh, there was a gentleman in a bowler cap holding Emma. Emma was the fell pony that the queen uh, was riding uh, when she passed. I mean, not literally when she passed, but I mean, that was her last pony that she was riding. Do you remember Emma or anything yes. about that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the touching scene is that there is Terry Pendry is the man in the bowler cap. He's standing amongst all the flowers that they have strewn by the side of the road. And there's Emma quietly on the procession, you know, and the queen's scarf was in the saddle, which is like, you know, like her helmet, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Was in yes. the saddle. And and that was just such a touching scene. And we're getting people, you know, have have sent us by the hundreds that scene, whether it's cut from a, a, a report, a, an interview, or even just a snapshot of their TV, you know, mm-hmm. when it was on there. And I think that was that was super touching. Terry Pendry is the gentleman that she would not ride with unless Terry was with her in the last few years. And and Dad was able to get him that job because it wasn't in the system to have that job for him because it's a generational position. And we've talked about it on the show, I know. But to see Terry front and center, and that was quite touching and, and quite wonderful, actually. Yes, it looked, we watched the, the procession on TV and a number of members of the staff were behind mm-hmm. him there, mm-hmm. which was lovely that they got mm-hmm. to go out and pay the, pay tribute. That was, lo- yes. I just thought that was great. I did yeah. too. I did too. Yeah. No, it was, it was quite wonderful. And so mom and dad were, um, if I didn't say this on the last tribute, they were part of the, the service that was at Windsor, which is St. George's 
chapel there, and that was 800. So I think there were 2,000 invites. The rest of them were at Westminster at uh, Buckingham Palace. So anyway, um, yeah, so that is behind us, but not the interviews done yet. Yeah, well, there, and it's interesting because I think for quite some time we will be talking about things that the Queen accomplished and things that the Queen had in the works and things that will go forward with that the queen was interested in and yes. found important. And some of those things were with Monty too. So we're going to be hearing about those things for quite some time to come. So that's one of the things that I th- is, think is interesting about one of our guests today is yeah. Monty's involvement with the Brook, one of the queen's passions. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to get to talk to uh, our, our first guest, mm-hmm. Jane Holderness Rodham, who also has a resume about as long as your arm. She was mm-hmm. she was very high up in the ranks of international three day eventing early on when the sport was very young. So I'm really curious to hear about some what they chat about because they have so many similar acquaintances over there in Europe. So it's going to be a cool, yeah, yeah a lot of intersections. It's going to be yeah. a cool conversation. Yeah. Well, I'm sitting here today with Jay Michelson of Hands on Gloves. And I, we were talking today about the horse that has sensitive skin or the animal that has sensitive skin, Jay. And I, I wanted you to help me address that a little bit. I know you've got some features to your products, but I know you know more about it than I do. So what do you do? What do you say to the, the owner that has somebody with sensitive skin? Our gloves are made from surgical grade nitrile. So that makes them chemical resistant, mildew resistant, because you can bathe with them too. They're made to get wet. Um, but across the board, there's no latex in them. So it's great for any animal, any people that have latex issues. There's no latex in it. They're just your hands. And if you have a thin skin horse or dog, they're, they're cats, other animals. There are many animals that don't like to be touched in certain areas. But having the gloves on, it's just your hands. You get immediate feedback if you get to an area of that animal that is sensitive. And you can apply less pressure in those areas, and you can apply more pressure in the other areas. Um, We have professional grooms that work from us. Um, They groom for Olympians across the board, and these guys are phenomenal. And they did a study on mainly thoroughbreds, thin skin thoroughbreds. Mm -hmm. And they found out that most people are grooming too light. (laughs) Oh, interesting. They're tickling the the horses. And went and applied just a little more pressure, and the horses loved it. Uh And that's kind of some of our experience with it. We we have all kinds of animals and experience with that. I think you can throw these in the wash machine. Am I right? You can. Next time you bathe your animals with them, use the gloves. A little bit of soap suds up all the way. And what we do after we bathe our animals with them, we rinse them off, hang them out to dry, and they go back to new. Um, You can throw them in the washing machine. Um, Just don't put them in the dryer. And um, just throw them in the washing machine hang them out to dry, and they go back to new. Well, Jay, how do people find out about you? Handsongloves.com. Monty Roberts was named Global Ambassador of the Brook in March of 2015 and was named Horse and Hound Magazine's Top 50 Horsemen of All Time. Jane Holderness Rodham has a lifelong passion for horses. She was the first British woman to ride in the Olympic three-day event team in Mexico in 1968, winning team gold. Jane also won badminton twice, 1968 and 78, and Burley once, 1976. Over the years, Jane has been recognized for her important role in the sport, including Lieutenant of the Royal Victorian Order, LVO, Commander of the Order of the British Empire, the CBE, Commander of the Victorian Order, CVO, and the BHS Queen's Award for Equestrianism in 2009. Jane also served as Lady-in-Waiting for the Princess Royal for over 30 years. Jane first joined Brooke as a trustee in 2003, serving for eight years before becoming an ambassador for the charity in 2022. Whilst a Brooke trustee, she has visited several of their overseas programs, including India and Senegal, to see firsthand the welfare conditions facing horses, donkeys, and mules 
and how Brooke has been providing assistance to them. Well, welcome. I've got Monty Roberts and not only the global ambassador of the Brook in Monty, but also Jane, a newly minted ambassador of the Brook. We might ask the question first. And I'll start with you, Jane, since you're probably brushed up on this more than Monty even. What is the Brook after all? Uh, well, it's a charity that um, looks after working horses, donkeys and mules um, throughout the world, really. And um, it also aims very much to not only help the animals, but the communities in which those animals work and live. Right. And and I know that uh, Dad has worked internationally around, he was, he'd was he gone to India with the Brook, which was really fascinating and eye-opening, right, Dad? Oh, it was indeed, yeah. Yeah, and so, and the Queen, of course, sent him off to demonstrate concepts, so he was able to do 41 countries. How much have you done outside of Britain, Jane? Have you been able to work with horses um, outside of the UK? With Brooke, uh, only I've been to two countries, which was uh, Senegal and um, to India a couple of years ago, um, yep. where I also saw all the um, uh, donkeys and mules working, uh, particularly in the brick kilns, which was um, a really hard environment for them. Mm, yeah, and your impressions of how the brook is doing there? I think it was spectacular, actually, that the difference you could see of where they just started on projects, and um, we were able to see somewhere that had been working for a couple of years, and the difference in the understanding, I think, of how an animal works because I think that was what was so uh, extraordinary when I first went there, was that it just was a way of life that had been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. And because they were so remote in these places, they just didn't seem to have seen any different way of doing it. And that seemed extraordinary when you think about it, because we've all seen things on the television or in the newspapers or just other people doing things, but they'd never experienced anything different and they just carried on in the same old way they've done for generations my goodness that sounds like a lot of your experiences too right dad yeah it's uh, very similar to what i would have said she said it better i think <clears throat> but mm -hmm. it's a it's about the way i found it too mm -hmm. yeah it's a lot of heavy heavy work yeah it's heavy work and i know that we we read in your bio that uh, you've been working with the Brook now since 2003. Um, what elevated you to go to the board of the Brook? Um, well, it was the sort of situation where they invite you. Um, mm. Somebody must have put my name up, I suppose. Mm. And um, uh, I got invited. Previous to that, I'd been working with World Horse Welfare, which was a slightly similar um, charity, but... Um, was less involved in, in the communities that looked after all these animals. It used to go out and give direct help, whereas the Brook is actually involved in helping the communities to understand how to look after their animals and helping them to do that, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have two people on the line in both of you that have... I think proven out the fact that the, their love for horses goes beyond their comp competitive edge in horsemanship. Do you think that gives you an edge? I'll, I'll ask dad first on this one, an edge that, to, to love the horse because both of you have competed at a high level and achieved at high levels. Um, or, or is that counter counterintuitive? Well, I don't think it's counter, but what you do have to do is recognize the personality of each person that's doing this and I know uh, a lot of people who have competed for years and years and years and still have very little respect for the horses they competed on. And then I know people who have competed uh, the same or even less who have great respect for the horses they computed, competed on. Mm -hmm. And so it's a personal thing. And you have to, I think you have to be prepared uh, under the brain to uh, love your horses before you work to change their life for the better. Um, it isn't everybody that can do it. For instance, Don Dodge is dead and gone now. 
Uh, but he produced world champion after world champion in the western area out here in uh, the western part of the United States. And he never liked a horse that he competed on. No. And uh, he, he he just didn't treat them as if they had any uh, need for respect at all. And um, it was hard for me to put up with that and still learn from him. But he was good and he did the job and he made champions. So I think it's a very personal thing. Uh, what do you think, Jane? Yeah, well, I would absolutely agree with what you say. But I think those sort of people are probably the same with humans as they are with animals. They don't understand humans much oh, better. You, <laughs> you, you're so right. You're so right. Because Dodge, I think he had four different wives. And nope. uh, it was a constant uh, familial problem with him. So I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, I, I think if you if you've got empathy with the people you work with, you you'll have empathy with the animals you work with, and they they will sort of they'll know who really understands them, won't they? They they sort of come to you when, as they certainly do to you, Monty. Um, you know they they absolutely well you you just do the right movements and you understand their body language, even though you can't talk to each other. You know, physically, you can get that communication through through body language. Oh, that mm. is so true. So true. Um, Dodge used to give me a hard time saying, they don't know what you're doing and they don't care. Uh, you're not going to get horses to like you or dislike you. They, they just don't have that capacity. Just give them a boot in the belly and ask them for their best. Mm. And I don't know how much of that he meant and how much he wanted to impress me that he was just a tough guy. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. They he he was certainly different from from mm. me. Well, different from both of you. Um, you you all obviously have risen to the cream of those helping horses out there, not only in your own countries but globally. But uh, but I I think it might be a good place too to talk a little bit about the brook. Um, certainly, news has happened since we booked this interview about the passing of Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II. And um, and I know, Monty, that you you attended the funeral at, at Windsor. Uh, but I thought it, it might be interesting to see if Jane has any intersections with the Queen too. Jane, had you ever been able to meet the Queen and or work with the Queen in any capacity? Very lucky. I, I um, did meet the Queen several times and she actually presented me with, with my um, badminton prizes both times I won and um, I I also work with the Princess Royal so I have met her on occasions and what a woman she's just something special as I think was shown in the recent um, mm. crowds worldwide she Absolutely. was just an amazing lady yeah yeah uh, way back when the when the castle burned when mm. Windsor burned yeah um I was training for she and her husband at that time. Uh, I had horses for them. And uh, so I'm sure she's she's followed me along, but I never had any personal contact or, you know, the queen never mentioned that I should do that until this COVID thing came along. And then everything was messed up to the point where I feel like I failed now. And, and uh, I should have been keeping... Camilla uh, aligned with what the queen was asking me to do. And I didn't do that. Part of it was the loss of Prince Philip and then um, the queen not being in good health and, and me trying to, you know, be as little trouble as I could to the queen. Mm -hmm. I, yes. I just didn't. I just didn't push all the buttons. And I, I, I now feel very um, sad about that. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I'm I, sure you shouldn't, because I, th yeah. I think, you know, it it will carry on and, and your influence will very much carry on because I I know, you know, how much the Queen admired your methods and everything. And the whole family have been very, uh, very much involved in that. That's nice. That's kind. I have a little story. And I think I think it was a, a great tribute to both Camilla and um, to Her Majesty. 
when we were at Buckingham Palace for a Brooke event, it was a fundraiser there that Camilla was hosting, I, I guess I would say yes, would be the yes, term. Yes. And it was it, it was a really fun time in that you brought, Dad, you brought that filly in from way outside the ring road in a field. I think she was that morning and, and uh, crying out and um, not knowing what the muse was all about. Um, a nice, nice group of very supportive people of the Brook, um, patrons and um, wonderful contributors to the cause. And we met several of them in a tea ride after. But I, I like to tell the part where the Queen wasn't necessarily expected to come. Definitely uh, Queen Consort, not at the time, but Camilla was supposed to be there and um, hosting. And when the queen came in. The energy just rose in the room. It was in the muse. It was wonderful. And the queen, she she's just became a tour guide at that point, giving Camilla uh, yeah. a blow by blow of what you were doing in the round pen to get the first saddle, bridle and rider on this little filly who was crying out at first and then became very calm and very sweet. And there's pictures now of Camilla, the queen and you, dad. Uh, at Buckingham Palace that I know that 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 image is going around a lot. And it's reminded me of that story. And Jane, I don't know if you were there or not, um, but I feel like there were lots of Janes in the room in that they were, you know, such, such good people for horses. And it was recognizable that this was going to go forward. And I think that was for me the moment where there was a shift from the queen to explaining Camilla, what you, not only that you had trained horses and you're a horse trainer, but that, that you had a different thing that the queen was promoting, which was the bridge to the human therapy world too, because you remember Katie Cunningham was there from Guatemala. She was in, she was inspired by the queen when given a certificate in 2012 years before she created a nonprofit in Guatemala called lead up for the, the youth down there. And so Katie was in the audience and we were able to come down and speak with Camilla and the queen about lead up in Guatemala. And since then, Camilla has seen a lead up in England now because Katie and being an expat uh, came over to, to the London area, Birmingham, I believe to do the first, Oh, it's with a, a, a nonprofit that Camilla is a part of called Ebony. And that's oh, yes, where they, yes, yes. you know, Ebony. Yeah. Yes, where that's they, it, yes. Yeah, wonderful. Um, good. Do you have a Do you have a, an interest in ebony, or you've just heard of it? Yeah, no, no. I've I've been to ebony several times. Um, Fantastic. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm quite involved because I was previously um, chairman of the Riding for the Disabled Association, mm-hmm. um, uh, and uh, that um, very much supports um, well riders, really disabled riders on horses, but. Um, all those organizations very often get together. So I get to know most of the organizations that either involve a horse or Mm. or humans in one way or another. Yeah. Good. That's wonderful. It's, it's so nice to know you, even if it's just by an audio voice here, it's just nice to know people that are out there for so long in your lives, contributing not only to the horses, but keeping horses in our lives, which I think is better for people in the long run anyway. Don't you? Yes. Yes, absolutely. No, yeah, and um, Jane, I I don't want to feel like I'm just getting on the phone and calling somebody and say, uh, I want Camilla to call me. I I don't want to seem to her like I'm being pushy at all about this, but I feel very sad that I haven't contacted her prior to the Queen's death because the queen was going to speak with her and uh, ask her to join with me and be the queen, if you will, Mm -hmm. uh, the queen's replacement in the movement that I've had globally, uh, along with other groups. We we have worked with many other groups, and I have no priority on this at all, but I find myself since the queen's death in a very difficult position to speak for the queen. And, um, I would want Camilla to know that I, I will be just as hardworking for her as I was for the queen. 
Well, I know how grateful she'll be about that. Uh, and what I'll do is, is I'll, um, I'll well, like, I'm actually going close to the office tomorrow, so um, I can call in there and, and speak to her um, private secretary and make sure she gets that message. Mm. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank I you really both. Yeah, I, I do too. That's that's very kind. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you both uh, joining us today too. Taking, I know how late it is over there in in your part of the world, Jane. And I appreciate it's been busy, probably a busy time with lots of reconnections since her passing. So I appreciate that you've taken the time out to give us a little bit of the story, and we'll make sure that we share how important the work at the brook is going and and your depth and the gratitude that we all have to those people who are out there working in India and Senegal and Egypt and all the places that Dorothy Brooke has now influenced it. I just want to say in in closing how much I congratulate you for your honors and achievements in this lifetime and I I feel like we're wearing the same Jersey and mm-hmm. working for the same causes, and um, I really appreciate your help. Well, I, I like that. That very much goes for you, um, Monty. It really does. It, it's been a, a privilege talking to you, and I've always been such an admirer of all the wonderful work you've done. So thank you very much, and it's good well, that we're all able that. to help the horses mm, through that's the right. brook. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you very much for that. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts. And I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it too on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online too on our forum. And there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. Veterinarian, artist, and author Madison Siemens is a lifelong professional horseman. His book, Never Trust a Sneaky Pony and Other Things They Didn't Teach Me in Vet School, is the result of his true experiences as a veterinarian in equine practice for over 30 years. This is a James Harriet meets Jeff Foxworthy approach to instruct and entertain real life adventures of a traveling horse doctor because you can't make this stuff up. It is fairly extensive study on the common medical problems seen in horses and how they're diagnosed and treated. Madison was one of seven presenters at the event that we call the movement with the topic of how horses vision influences their behavior. Well, Dr. Madison Siemens, DVM, welcome. How are you? Oh, I'm doing just great. I'm uh, living the dream. You're living the dream. Well, that's what I like to hear in my vet. I like my vet nice and happy and and anxious to see me and not not anxious to see my horses too much, actually. (laughs) Well, ignorance is bliss, and I'm the happiest guy in New Mexico. Oh, you're so bad. Yeah, so you've moved from, we'll do a little quickie here. You were in, I think, Idaho, right, before? Yes, yes. And you moved to New Mexico, and you're living the dream because what are the ingredients there in New Mexico that drew you there? Headed you home. yeah, I, I I spent my my high school years here a long time ago, and and I've always wanted to come back, and so I just you know had some opportunities uh, to come back to my old stomping ground and uh, still practicing medicine, and enjoying life, and riding my horses, and just we just got back from South Dakota riding up there at uh, Mount Rushmore, which was just a phenomenal ride. Beautiful. And uh, yeah, just, at the Black uh, Hills, how how many people got to go up to the Black Hills with you? We we went with uh with just a couple of, of old friends of ours and there was a uh, another group that we rode we kind of camped with but sort of rode separately but if you if you've never been to the to Mount Rushmore it's a it's an incredible place but the beautiful part about the way we saw it was we got to see it from the back of a horse yeah and so the way the the way the trail goes for the horses is you don't see the visitor center and the tour buses and the asphalt you just go up this trail and all of a sudden there's the monument and all you see is pine trees and monument is it was it was a once in a lifetime opportunity we just loved it ah that's oh and i hope it's not a once in a lifetime but it sounds like a really cool thing bucket list to do for sure oh, absolutely I, yeah and and are you so you're near rio doso i think you had We're, told me yeah and just just north of rio doso about about 20 minutes a little town called capitan it's home of Smokey the bear 
No way. Is that right? <laughs> uh, well, it's good to hear your voice. My gosh, we haven't even done a face-to-face, I think, since you were here for the movement a few years ago. It was so right. fun to have you. Very, very interesting dynamics because it was COVID time. And you were like, bugger that. I'm coming down, which was great. <laughs> I'm glad. Oh, you- we had a great we had a great time with you and your dad, and uh, I just I wish I lived closer. I think we could have a lot of fun together. Oh, no kidding. Don't, no kidding, Dr. Sim. It's a really fun, and it was fun to have Jamie Jennings here, host of the oh, yeah. Horses oh, yeah. in the Morning show, you know, and uh, she still jokes about that live streaming thing because it was really just a, a handful of us around here, and uh, it was live streaming, so we put it on Horse and Country TV because it was COVID, so we couldn't have yep. it live. And uh, later on, when Jamie was thinking about leaning over that horse it was a mounting block lesson that she was giving leaning over the horse and nothing but her breeches showing you know she she found out that the queen had been watching and said she wanted all her horses to train to come to the mounting block like that and jamie went what the queen was watching me on that (laughs) that beautiful cremello stallion that was just so much fun that was just so much fun and you were so kind to, to drive all the way down and back up but i wanted to have you on today too because i heard from there's a wonderful publisher called trafalgar and trafalgar has been important in our lives too a book publishing company because they really do capture the horse world and a lot of the animal world in their in their books and your book never trust a sneaky pony and other things they didn't teach me in vet school, uh, I love that, um, is going international now. So are they going to be rebranding it? It's going to look the same or what happens? Well, this is kind of Sneaky Pony 2.0. I had self-published for a while and and, uh, I finally found an agent that uh, that took a chance on me and and Mm -hmm. Trafalgar took a big chance on me. And I just, you know, hope I don't embarrass him too much. But Uh uh, it looks like we're gonna we're gonna get that thing launched. And so what I what I did was uh, I wrote some more stories. I, I did uh, several of the illustrations. I did the cover art, and uh, so it's a it's a whole new version of the of the original. And there's several hundred of the of the first out there internationally. But uh, I think this is gonna be this is gonna take off. You can buy you can you can pre order it now at, at Amazon, but uh, okay. we probably won't be out. It's 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 actually it's it's at the designers right now, and it should go to print here in another week or ten days, and it should be available for uh, for a Christmas time uh, release. And it's again that you can pre order it on Amazon. Perfect. Okay, and never trust a sneaky pony, and that's yep. by Dr. Madison Siemens. So yeah, everybody mm-hmm. should see that. It's really funny, and and you've got a beautiful new. I was just looking at your Facebook page. You're such an artist too. Beautiful Palomino, and uh, yeah, people should go see your Facebook page too. The reason I wanted to have you on today, though, too, is you had mentioned, you just sent me notes saying that there are some developments possibly in in some stem cell therapy. And I always lean in on that because this to me is a a direction that, you know, we we probably haven't gone to the end of the hallway yet in in, uh, what it can do for us. But tell me, tell me what you found out. When, when we talk about stem cells, it's in a way our, our use of them therapeutically is much the way the, that many drugs get used. And there's a, there's a there's a lifetime, a lifespan, a life event situation where when it first comes out, it does everything. And then after a couple of years, it does nothing. And then after three or four or five years, this is what it will do. Mm. So we're kind of in that area with our stem cells. And um, it's it's so interesting that a, a stem cell is is actually a cell that lives in various parts of the body. And what it is, it's the body's a, attempt to regenerate damaged tissues. And they come from bone marrow. They come from fat cells. There's lots of places that we can get stem cells. And when I was in veterinary school, when the Earth's surface was still cooling, <laughs> the stem stem cell was a concept, but nobody had ever seen one. And most of what we had focused on was the bone marrow derived stem cells. And fast forward, you know, 175 years, and now we kind of understand what a stem cell really is and what it looks like. And now we can actually harvest them. And one of the first guys to do this therapeutically is our friend Doug Herthel, a few a few miles down the road from you guys at Alamo exactly. Pentadol. He was doing this back in the 90s. Yeah. And and it was so interesting because he was he was using bone marrow derived stem cells and and it was very interesting because he he could give these to some horses. He started using these on tendonitis cases, 
Mm-hmm. And so we could give these to some horses and they would respond. And then he could give these to others and they just, it just didn't seem to matter. So now fast forward 30 years. Now we have a little bit of a better idea about what's going on here. And so this is a tissue just like any other organ. And uh, one of the studies that was just presented at last year's Association of Equine Practitioners meeting, which is an international body that uh, it's an educational body and a research body. So the AAAP, they have a, a an annual convention where they put out all the new stuff, and it's just so fun. It's just like yeah, trying to drink out of a trying to, trying to drink out of a fire hose, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but one of the, one of the interesting things that came out of this meeting is these these stem cell treatments. And part of the reason some of them are failing is because of a, of a tissue allograft rejection. So, for example, if you get a kidney transplant, you're going to have to have somebody that's pretty closely related to you. And even at that, some of those horse, some of those horses, some of those organs are going to be rejected if you're not on some type of immunosuppressive therapy for the rest of your life because of this organ rejection. Oh, is that well, right? come, the rest come, of your life? Mm. Oh, yeah. Come to find out is that the stem cells that are in that are they're called banked stem cells so i got a horse with a bow tendon and i would like to put some stem cells in there but i don't want to wait to culture his own stem cells and get a billion of them i want to go ahead and just buy some ready-made off the shelf at the mm-hmm. local walmart and so walmart walmart said you know stem cells are us send you you know a vial, vial of stem cells and you inject it in the horse and it's a three or four thousand dollar deal mm-hmm. well come to find out is that these horses are rejecting those and so that's why they're not working so what we need to do is we need to culture the horse's own stem cells okay. and that takes time so what we we'll do is we, we can take them either either from blood from fat tissue i mean there's lots from hair follicles there's lots of places we can take them from we send them off to a specific lab and they will culture those and get several hundreds millions of these cells to inject into the area that we would like to treat how long does and that take does that take That's, a long time no, to culture? No, no, a couple, couple weeks. Oh, okay, all right. A couple weeks. We're not talking about forever because mm-hmm. there's it's it's a it's an exponential cell growth. Okay, so each cell divides, you know, once, and so you got you got two, then you got four, then you got sixteen, and mm-hmm. pretty soon you got you know lots. Okay. But the interesting thing about this is, and what one of the fun parts about having been watching this go on for the last thirty years is that I've seen it, I get to see it go through all types of different phases about how we approach these things, what we're going to use, how we're going to use them, where we're going to put them. And there's a a great review article that's, oh, it's about 10 years old now, uh, that actually looked at about 20 of these fairly carefully controlled studies about the effect of these things. And the interesting thing about some of these therapies, let's just talk about tendonitis for a second, because that's probably where they've been used the most. So suspensory ligament damage, deep flexor, superficial flexor tendon, these are the injuries that are going to be responsible for probably the most common cause of early retirement in in, uh, in any discipline, uh, equine athletes, is because of tendon soft tissue injuries below the knee or the hawk. Yeah. So that's that's where they're going to be found mostly to, to be used in, in the most most of the time. Mm-hmm. But so this review study looked at about 20 of these, and it's pretty discouraging. The, the, yeah. Some of these studies are not carefully controlled. So in other words, they'll have they'll have you know 20 or 30 horses that they treated, but they have no control. So they didn't they didn't take a horse with a similar lesion and just put saline in that thing or just uh, stick a I needle see. in there. Okay, so there's a lot of these horses are going to get better no matter what you do. Yeah, and and the interesting, th- even a more interesting thing about this is sometimes the aftercare in this thing is about a year. Oh, yeah, that's not interesting. <laughs> that's discouraging. <laughs> well, but... it takes it's it's inner. It's when we when we look at the physiology of these soft tissue structures. Okay, the 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 collagen fibers that make up a tendon or a ligament get replaced by the body at about a about a nine month rotation, mm-hmm. and so. Four and a half months ago, the collagen fiber that was in this horse's deep flexor tendon were not there. These are brand new. And so it takes about nine months for the body to remodel and rebuild because they break these little fibers just incidentally, just walking around. They're very, very small. They're cells. And so the body regenerates those. And so when we get a catastrophic breakdown where we've got a torn 
ligament or tendon where we see a core lesion with the ultrasound. Now we've got to think about, okay, what are we going to do with this? I've been, I've been studying tendonitis since the early 70s. And the, Dr. Frank Milne used to be the head of the veterinary college at Guelph. In fact, he's, he's the guy that, that we have a lifetime achievement award now, award for veterinarians. And so if you've been doing something for 20 or 30 years that has really affected the lives of horses and, and, and how we approach them, you can win the Frank Milne Award. Yeah. When, so when I, was a, when I was an undergrad, I was really interested in tendonitis. And uh, so I wrote him a letter. He had done more work about, about tendonitis up to that point. Now, this was back in about, oh, golly, this, this is 50 years ago. Mm, and what wow. we were doing for ten, what we were doing for tendonitis in those days is we were pin firing these horses. Yes. So they they would take a red hot iron and it kind of looked like a old soldering iron, soldering gun, and they would burn holes in the back of this horse's leg. Mm-hmm. And the concept was we're going to take a chronic debilitating process and turn it into an acute inflammatory process yeah. and help healing. Well, it doesn't. And I wish I wished I'd have saved that letter. There's so many things oh, that have just right. gone away. I wish I'd have saved that letter because here's this guy. He's the head of the, one of the biggest veterinary colleges in the world. He's done more work on tendonitis than anybody alive. And here's this punky little undergrad from Texas A&M writes him a letter, a handwritten letter with a ballpoint pen. And says, "What do you think about this?" And he takes the time to write me back. Nice. And his yeah. his yeah. research his research showed. That pin firing these horses, this is they call this counter irritation. Yeah. Pin firing these horses made the, this is his quote, it makes the leg look so bad that the people will leave him alone for a year, and that's what they should have done in the first place. There was the reasoning. Oh, that is hilarious. I never knew why they did that stuff. I mean, in theory, I suppose one day in a lab, it kind of sounded okay, but I mean, you know what? Dr. Siemens, I still see pin firing on some OTTBs. I see the oh, yeah. residuals, and they're oh, yeah. still doing this out there. They're still doing it. Yeah. That's because Dr. Jones did, because that's because Dr. Smith did that. I guess that's the good old days <laughs> and and bad old days. And so now you're finding these stem cells. Here's what I don't understand enough about stem, stem cells is do you just inject them in there and the body doesn't absorb them? How, what is what is the process? Maybe you can Maybe you can help us with that. Oh, that is such a great question, and that that that, seg- that segues into my next my next uh, topic about why or why we should not use these things. Uh, it's very interesting. There was a study done not too long ago where they actually labeled these stem cells with some fluorescent dye, ah, and uh, and what they did was so they would inject a, a lesion and then and then come back and look for it later. And uh, come to find out that a whole bunch of these stem cells wind up someplace else. Yeah. So yeah. you can you can put them in a core lesion, in other words, a, a, an area that's damaged in a tendon or a ligament, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to stay there. Mm-hmm. And and the, another interesting part of why I'm a little bothered by the lack of control about some of these studies is back in the, when they were still pin firing horses. Another guy came along named Oshheim, and he decided that uh, pin firing was probably pretty stupid. And what he did was he took a, 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 a scalpel blade, and, uh-huh. and in an area where he figured the tendon was bowed, this is way before ultrasound, but it would just have a big fat tendon, mm-hmm. and he would, just, he would just poke a hole in that area that was inflamed, mm-hmm. like he was going to drain it or something, which there's no real pocket there to drain. Yeah. But he would just irritate that tendon with a scalpel blade. And a bunch of those horses came back to do just fine. So I'm uh-huh. wondering, I'm wondering if just injecting something into that area, if just that 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 act of injecting something is enough uh-huh. of a stimulus to turn on these stem cells that are in that tendon to begin with. Interesting. This, this, these are just a question. You know, I don't, I don't know the answer. Right. But it's really it's it's the whole part of of what we have. What I say we what has been done with stem cells over the last twenty or thirty years. Somebody took the time to figure out, and not, this may sound kind of mean, but hang with me for a second. You'll see, okay. see where I'm going. <laughs> Somebody figured out a way to give a rat a heart attack. Oh. And, and yes, I, somebody had a lot of time on their hands. So what okay. they did was they've, they've caused a, a, an ischemic injury to a rat's heart, sure. meaning that there's a lack of blood flow. And so if this was a person, that they would go in for a bypass. 
Well, with the rat, you can actually harvest his own stem cells and culture them so that he's got a bunch of them. And then you can give him a heart attack, and then tomorrow you inject those stem cells into his jugular vein, and guess where they wind up? They want to help that heart out. Amazing. Right where that infarct is. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we're we're looking at these things now, and it's not just a matter of, of working on, on tendon or ligament injuries. There's uh, some really interesting work that's being done in non-union fractures. And so you've got a horse that's broken his leg and we've cast it we tend it we've done all these things and yet boy oh boy we come back in a couple of months and uh, we're still not seeing any kind of healing coming across that bridge and so they have put some stem cells and not in horses this has just been in humans with non-union fractures and typically in a human when you get a non-union fracture the next thing to do is amputation because uh, blood flow gets shut off you start losing blood flow to the soft tissues and and you start that part that's broken is, is necrotizing and you get gangrene and you die. So those yeah. non-unions will result in amputation in some of these horses. I mean, some of these humans. So they've yeah, done some of those, do uh, these allograft, these allograft stem cells. In other words, coming from that same person mm-hmm. and actually been able to get those bone cells to bridge that gap. And, and the follow up on these things is six or seven years. These people are totally normal. That's amazing. That's amazing. I love that that there are different species that can help, you know, another by helping us out. And I appreciate that. I, I've got some clunking in the background. I'm not sure. We've got squeaky chairs or something going on, but um, but and it's degrading. So I'm going to let you go. But I love I love that there are people getting back to simple with some of these applications too. Uh, as as rocket scientists as we can get with medicine, sometimes you know going back to and questioning those those uh, simple things that we were doing back then, and maybe just a ch- quick change up on some of them. Like the pin firing thing is bad, we know that, but it may have created some sort of element of irritation. Maybe we didn't have to go that it, like anything. Maybe we didn't have to go so far with an extreme application of something, um, but it might still work. Always, always interesting to talk to you, Deb. Uh, oh, thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much for being on. We're going to look for that book. Go to Amazon and look for "Never Trust a Sticky Pony" and buy it for Christmas. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> thank you. I'm, I'm going to keep my day job, but maybe maybe yeah. we can sell a few books. <laughs> oh, please do. We want to support that day job. So yes, please. Thanks. Thank you so much. Hey, give my best to Dad. Leave this world a better place, Emma. The magic in the language of the herd. Up next, Lee Hansen gives us tips on loading on the trailer and pressure and release. Welcome back, Lee Hansen. We're privileged and honored to have you back. And I understand that you've uh, thought up a trainer's tip for us. We'd love to share you. I have, absolutely. You know, a lot of people, I, I watch them try to load these young horses in the trailer for the first time or get a horse into a stall that, that has never been into a stall, or walk on concrete. And, and I watch these people literally have a tug-of-war with this horse. And, and you, you shoot yourself in the foot right off the bat when you do that. Horses uh, horses are, are naturally um, going to respond to pressure and release of pressure. And the biggest part I think that people miss is that release of pressure. And you can't drag a horse anywhere. And so when you're loading a horse in a trailer or you're holding them into a stall, it's okay to pull that lead rope tight and just hold it. Don't yank on it. Don't pull on it. Don't jerk on it. But just hold that firm pressure there. And the moment they shift their weight forward at all or move the tiniest bit, let that lead rope go and pet that horse. And I guarantee you that that horse will continue to make those small steps. It may not be as fast as you would like, but they will make those small steps and get in the trailer, go into the stall, walk across that concrete, whatever it would be. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to MontyRoberts.com and click on the words Ask Monty at the bottom of the page. Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged. 
We have October 3 through 5, the introductory course, Module 3, that's long lining. October 6 through 8, the introductory course, Module 4, that's prep for those intro exams. October 12th, we have Horsemanship 101. October 15, Mountain Trail Play Day. That's fun. Once a month, we do that. October 21 through 23, Horse Sense and Healing for our veterans and first responders with post-traumatic stress. October 31, November through November 11 is the advanced exams. Then November 12th, we have a mountain trail play day. November 14th through December 2nd, we have an advanced course. December 17th, we have a mountain trail play day. We have a lot of play days. And then December 16th through 18, we have our horse sense and healing last one for the year. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and you can find all of that information and more at MontyRoberts.com. You can also call Flag is Up Farm, which is also open to the public. You can also visit during regular business hours. All of that can be found at 805-688-6288. And for details about today's show, you're going to go to HorsemanshipRadio.com where you're going to find links, photos, and more information. And also this podcast. That's right. No kidding. And as always, we love your feedback. Please follow us on Facebook under Facebook.com forward slash Monty Roberts or on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash Monty underscore Roberts and Instagram, my favorite, instagram.com forward slash Monty underscore Roberts forward slash. That's crazy. There's a, there's a lot of slashes going on there. <laughs> and many, many thanks to our sponsors, hands-on gloves, handiest doggone grooming tool you're ever going to find for your dogs, cats, llamas, Whatever you've got. If it's a furry creature, it's going to love being scrubbed being scrubbed with a hands-on glove. And by the way, mm-hmm. did you know that you can use a hands-on glove to fluff up your wool saddle pad? Oh, that's a great idea. Hello? No, I've cleaned my saddle pads with it, but to fluff up a wool one, I, I, I guess I was thinking I had the felt one that I was doing the other See, day. See, the felt one, you're right. And I don't use felt ones being an English writer, I, uh, but I have that's one true. that's made of sheepskin. So it's the fluffy ah. sheep. You know, she's wool. And they want to get matted. They need to be fluffed up regularly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can use your hands on gloves to do that. So just another use. Smart. (laughs) Okay. And our other sponsor too is MontyRobertsUniversity.com because we love that. We do that every week. We have a new lesson added to that. And we have a lot since 2009 now. (laughs) We've put out those. And they're great. They're a legacy to dad, but they're also the greatest learning tool, I think, for equestrians there is. Be sure to visit all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network too at horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours. 